speak tonight about humans and, and, and how diverse and complicated we are and how, on the one hand, uh, I think it's clear that, that hunting was an indelible feature of our, of our species evolution and, and remains a crucial cultural component of the way in which we interact with nature. And at the same time, it is part of our nature, uh, if I can use that word in double ways, uh, it is part of our nature uh, to try to dominate. And I think we need to reflect on the tension between being in nature, a part of nature, and being apart from nature uh, as the essence of our ethical dilemma as we try to navigate a very complicated and increasingly complicated world. But first let me say, uh, and this really follows on what Mary observed, that, that, that hunting is, 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 is indelibly part of our culture. Uh, and at the, at the risk of, of going to extremes, it's not that we all have to hunt. Certainly that would be a nightmare. <laughs> and it was never the case, even with our hunting gathering ancestors, that everyone hunted. Um, the hunting was usually left to the young and the agile uh, and, and, and so on. And, and, and so it's not a question that everybody has to hunt, but that hunting represents a kind of relationship that we bear with nature, an appropriative na uh, a relationship with nature. Without that appropriation, without gathering and without hunting, we would not exist. And that cultural context is being challenged dramatically today, uh, not, not in any direct or even necessarily self-conscious way, uh, by the fact that more and more of us have almost no direct contact with the natural world. And that's something that hunting preserves, and I would go on to say that gardening preserves that as well. Uh, and, and, and so what we need and what we lack currently, and we'll come, I'm sure, in our discussion to talk about the role of youth and, and their lack of engagement with the natural world as one of the fundamental problems uh, that, that, that we confront. But let's turn now directly to hunting. Uh, I'm sure you all are aware that the, that the, the reception, the public reception of hunting uh, is, is, is very broad, but it is also deeply conditional. Uh, one might think, uh, for example, that, that yes, large numbers of people when asked the question, do you support legal hunting, uh, will answer yes, numbers in the 70% range. And similarly, when you ask, do you approve of hunting for food, a large, large proportion of the American public uh, uh, approves of hunting for food. Turn the word just slightly and ask these same people, uh, do you approve of hunting for sport? And support begins to weaken and waver and decline. Uh, killing for fun, which of course is a misunderstanding uh, on the public's part, but that's what sport means. Sport means, well, you don't really need to do this. It's, it's, it's recreation. And killing for recreational purposes uh, ought to be really problematic or seen as problematic. And then, in addition to, to that, change the wording just a little bit and ask people uh, how they feel about trophy hunting. And starting out in the 70% approval of legal hunting or hunting for food, support for trophy hunting drops down to 38% in most recent polls. Uh, and much, much lower, by the way, if you, if you divide men and women. Women uh, have a much, much lower support for, for trophy hunting than men. But overall, 38%. That poses, it seems to me, a, a, a really significant challenge uh, to, to what the ethical relationships of hunting are uh, and, and how the public can support or will continue to support uh, hunting. Uh, it, is, it is clear from the most recent research uh, that, that hunting is supported when it can be demonstrated to be fair, fair chase. We'll talk more about that, I'm sure, as we go along this evening. Uh, and when it does not get uh, overly technolo technologically sophisticated uh, uh, and, and, and technologically uh, uh, complicated and, and, and effective. 
And yet here we are as a species uh, known for developing technology that makes our lives easier. Uh, easier and more precarious and more complicated, but, but nonetheless easier. And so we have, it, it seems to me as a species, uh, a, a deep conflict between wanting to do things r ethically and correctly and wanting to do things easily and efficiently. Uh, and that poses, it seems to me, some of the serious uh, uh, challenges that, that hunting and hunters face. And, and how they respond to these challenges, it seems to me, is, is really going to be vitally important going forward. One of the problems, or, or let me back up, one of the, one of the ways in which uh, American wildlife was saved, and we referred to uh, Ted Roosevelt's great-grandfather uh, as being uh, uh, vital in uh, key to this, was the implementation of, of laws that restrained the taking of game, uh, particularly importantly uh, to eliminate market hunting, hunting for profit. Get the business out of the commercial arena uh, and establish game laws and bag limits and seasons uh, and let nature rebound. And indeed, nature did rebound. Uh, and, and in some areas of the country, in New England, for example, uh, white-tailed deer have rebounded so, so dramatically that they're now becoming uh, a, a, a serious problem. Hunting in the contemporary era is increasingly becoming commercialized uh, through the, the, the sale of, of hunting leases, leases uh, through the, the loss of public access to large stretches, particularly in the east, uh, of, of land suitable for hunting. Uh, and in the process, uh, game itself has been commodified. Uh, and commodified in a very sinister and I think very, very uh, ethically problematic way. Uh, you saw Mary Stang's uh, 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 mule deer uh, with a gorgeous rack of antlers. Uh, of which anyone uh, could be proud. Uh, the commercialization of hunting has led to the breeding of white-tailed deer. That's a, quote, trophy deer. Uh, it, is, it is bred artificially inseminated, uh, and, and, and the semen of these deer uh, bring, fetch high prices, and they're usually shot in enclosed areas uh, so that someone can raise uh, this <laughs> this rack on their wall. That's a, a grotesque animal. Uh, and it is being bred deliberately in order uh, to, to basically commodify the species. Uh, and it bears almost no relationship whatever, no recognizable relationship uh, to anything remotely approaching either fair chase or a respect for the wildness uh, of, of the animals. It's a deep contradiction uh, that, that our, our, our appetites are, are, are fueled by the desire to get bigger and more complicated and, in this case, more grotesque. And, and I ask, you know, rhetorically, obviously, at this point, uh, what happens when these mutant species, uh, as they inevitably will, escape from the game farms and the, and the game ranches uh, and begin to interbreed with wild animals? What happens to the wildness? What happens to the beauty? Uh, and what happens to the, to the experience of, of pursuing uh, uh, animals that, that, are, uh, uh, that are gorgeous as opposed to grotesque. The other challenge is, again, deeply rooted in, in our capacity, our profound capacity, uh, for technological innovation. Uh, we started out, obviously, as a species, uh, hunting with stones and sharpened sticks uh, and the like. Um, part of what we have done over the hundreds of thousands of years of our evolution, uh, actually it's about 150,000 years of modern Homo sapien sapien, uh, is to uh, increasingly perfect our weapons and, and our capacity to kill. Uh, and that has resulted in recent years uh, in, in what I think can only be called the militarization of hunting. Uh, this is now, these are examples of, of modern uh, deer rifles. The bottom two with scopes, the other with, uh, with open sights. Uh, they're very efficient. Uh, a good marksman with any one of these guns could, could be effective at 200 to 300 yards. 
Uh, some people are trying to do extreme uh, distance shooting now, uh, pushing the envelope, and there's a huge ethical uh, uh, controversy about that within the ranks of hunters because the longer the, the, the range that you r try to reach out to, the more likely it is that you will wound and not, and not uh, reduce to possession uh, the animal. Uh, so, but there again, we're pushing the limits, trying to challenge ourselves uh, to do uh, the, what was even a short time ago uh, imp judged impossible. Uh, but it raises all kinds of ethical challenges. Uh, but these are, these are modern ri uh, deer rifles. This is, I guess we could call it, the postmodern deer rifle. It is now in production. Uh, it, for civilian use, it was designed uh, for military sniping. Uh, the apparatus that you see above the barrel uh, are, are laser beams. Uh, you can work this weapon from your iPad or your iPhone. Uh, and its range, its range is 12 to 1500 yards. And it is deadly accurate. Now what does this say about fair chase? When you enter an animal's territory, an animal's habitat, Fair chase means that you engage that animal with its senses fully engaged. Its hearing, its, its smell, its vision, etc. At, <laughs> at, at 1,200 yards, you might as well be on the moon as far as that animal is concerned. He has or she has absolutely no defense, no capacity for evasion or eluding because as far as it is concerned, you're not anywhere near uh, any, you don't pose any danger, any risk at all. This gun has a laser dot that, that you trigger, not pulling the trigger yet, but that you trigger, and it puts a laser dot in the, the cameras and in the scopes of this computer-driven uh, rifle, and the animal can move, and the laser dot goes with it, and the gun follows it. The hunter doesn't do anything. The, you can decide if you want to really be hands-on. You can pull the trigger, uh, but you don't have to do that, and that might cause the gun to lurch a little bit and, and, and so on. So just press the enter key on your, on your iPad, uh, and the gun goes off, and yes, the animal drops. Uh, and, and this, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, $30,000 is the copy that gets sold to the Pentagon. But Remington has entered into contract with the developers of this gun. It's called TrackPoint uh, for in the range of $2,000 to $2,500. Uh, this is going to be, if nothing is done about it, if no laws are passed or regulations are passed that make this illegal, this is going to be uh, the weapon of choice uh, for people who, uh, in, in fact, don't want to practice marksmanship, don't want to learn deeply how a gun functions, uh, don't want to put up with the fact that human beings flinch uh, <laughs> or get a little excited and, and lose a little bit of control uh, and miss. Uh, this is the technological sublime run to horrendous uh, uh, lengths, it seems to me. And, and there will be a market for it, mind, uh, mark my words. And, and I think that, that exposes the, the entire hunting community, unless it speaks out uh, about this tendency to get more and more militarized, night vision scopes, drones are being used to scout animals uh, remotely. Uh, unless we resist these impulses, uh, I'm afraid that the, the whole idea of the humanity of the hunt, to which Mary has just spoken so eloquently, uh, is, is going to be lost in a, in a sea of, of public resentment and resistance and, 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 and I'm afraid that the, f the fate of hunting uh, will, will really be a sorry state indeed. And I leave you with that warning, uh, not pessimistic, because we can resist. We, can, we passed game laws at the early part of the 20th century uh, that preserved wildlife, and we can pass laws and regulations uh, that will preserve the, the idea and the value of fair chase and the very human essence of a contest with 
uh, with wild animals on their terms, not on ours. Thank you. <laughs>